The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Next presenters, Professor Frosch from Purdue University and Professor Bazan from Northwestern University. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the topic here, obviously we're talking about one-way shear, but I wanted to mention this unified approach because I think there's two parts to this. One is a unified approach to what we're going to see that it can do in terms of pre-stress, reinforced, FRP, steel, axial loads. It covers all type of different areas. But I'll, I'll stand over here. Thanks. But uh, the, uh, the other part which I wanted to mention is it's unified in terms of, you can see the author list here, we combined various proposers together and came up with an approach that we felt like combined the benefits of a lot of different attributes. And Professor Bazan going to talk in a little bit about some of the parts that we've combined together. So let me talk about a little bit on the stress. So in the average distribution, if we're taking a look at this, the average stress that we've been using in the code is based upon a stress that's on average V over BWD. Because we were looking at a, cr a section, if you will, between two flexural cracks. That's where the history comes back from where we're looking at. And originally it actually wasn't BD, it was JBD was the stress that used to be there. So we, we averaged everything on this and we looked at stresses that would be and two root came about and I'll show that in a second. But what we're looking at is saying, hey, let's look at a crack and look at the tip of that crack above it because at a crack section we don't have the whole section we can work with, only the BWC. So now let's look at that as an average stress. <coughs> now, talking about two root, which has been in the code, we're using this area, if you will, effectively and averaging over that. This is what the data does. And what you can see is there's a huge trend with reinforcement ratio. So as the reinforcement goes up to one, two, four, three, four, some of these get unreasonable because those were tests that were trying to make sure that they were a shear failure. But you can see there's a dramatic trend. And what's really the problematic, which I think is reason many of us are here today, is below 1%, you can see a dramatic reduction in shear strength below one, and two root has an issue. You also see that this is FRP reinforcement. FRP effectively, if I normalize that by the modular ratio, you get very low effective reinforcement ratios, and hence FRP cannot be designed this way. In fact, the approach we're using now is how ACI 440 designs for shear reinforcement and for shear is using this same approach that we're going to talk about now. So 5 root F prime C is what we found is was an average using this stress based upon BC, where BC is how much compression zone we have. And C can simply be calculated as KD, right? There's another form of it. So if we can calculate the compression zone, we say that all the shear is carried there on average. And when we do that and replot those results, look how nice it does. Across the entire row range, this fits the data, including FRP. If anything, FRP is showing a little bit higher there using the five root. Hence, this is why 440 adopted this approach for use for FRP reinforced members. Pre-stress members. We can do the same thing. All we have to do is calculate the neutral axis depth. It's just using mechanics. There's nothing magical about it. We use strain compatibility, and at any pre-stress level, any moment that's applied, we can calculate what C is and calculate the, the force. So on a crack section, it's simply 5 root F prime C, B, W, C. That's VCI, if you will, in terms of the way we currently look at it. It's a crack section. Now what happens if I have an uncracked section? What uncracked, the C, the whole thing is together. So it turns out that we can use the same expression. Actually, we could count for some of the pre-stress, BW and its H, the entire section's there, with some addition for the axial load that's there from the pre-stressing. But we could simplify this and simply say it's 5 root F prime C, BW, where C now becomes H because the entire section's there. It's a very simple flight approach, and it's conservative. <clears throat> so when I talked about the unification of approaches here, what we looked at is very large beams. There's concern when I especially get to these extremely large, 100 inches higher, greater kind of dimensions. So we have this basic VC equation, but if we put a size effect gamma D here, well, we can just say it's one here, so it goes to the base equation. If we have an unreinforced section with less than 10 inches of effective depth, or if we have reinforcement, at least put the minimum reinforcement in that we need for stirrups, 
and if we're less than 100 inches in depth, which covers most beams, we want to promote shear reinforcement anyway. So only in thin slabs will we have this where we're one, but otherwise if we have transverse reinforcement, we're good to go with one. But otherwise, we do need to consider a size effect, and this is the expression that's based upon 446, and Zednik's going to talk a little bit more about that, because here this kicks in once we get above these ranges. On my own. Thank you. All right, so the picture of the side effect curve we have uh, in logarithmic plot, and uh, in a in logarithmic plot, in a linear plot, the blue is for shear reinforcement. The other, uh, without shear reinforcement, this is the, with the shear reinforcement. Now, theoretically, this curve should continue up, but because of increased scatter, we agreed that uh, it's probably better to cut it off at one. This is in linear scale here. So for many beams, there will be no change. Uh, this is uh, a formula approved by ACR 446 based on many considerations, uh, fracture mechanics, dimensional analysis, uh, regression of data, computational simulation, and so forth. We don't need to go to in details about this, but I would like to explain why do we have the size effect. It is not a derivation, but explanation. And it comes out if you calibrate a computer program with a good damage model, such as microplane model, the existing data, and then run it, and you can also calculate the stresses. So what is found out, that in a small beam, the normal component of the compressive stress, which is actually inclined, is nearly uniform. It amounts to about 0.85 maximum strength. In a deep beam, the maximum moves as we are loading, and uh, uh, there is a, is localized, and in maximum load you have this curve. So the section in a small beam is nearly fully localized, in large beam is not. And if you look at the uh, contribution of aggregate interlock this way, so that's which underlines the European code, uh, we see a nearly uniform distribution of the vertical component, which is a normal shear of the interlock stress in a small beam, and in total it carries only 40%, so this is more important. And in a large beam, this carries only 5%. Why? Because the distribution localizes as the cracks opening. So that's familiar to all kinds of phenomena in quasi-orbital fracture, and that's explanation, although not the derivation of the size effect. Now, it is interesting to plot the total force carried by concrete. Uh, nominal stress uh, multiplied by, uh, by the depth. So in current wave, with no side effect, is a straight line. At the other extreme is the European model code, which comes actually to a constant value, uh, which is thermodynamically impossible. It means here if you double the load, uh, double the depth, no effect. Uh, although real structures are somewhere here, they don't go that far. Then we have the model of ACR 446, the formula we are using, and the classical formula JSC, which is statistical, great feat in 1980, no other side effect was known 35 years ago, but it's totally obsolete. Uh, now, uh, if we plot the whole database, then of course uh, we get uh, disparities here, but these plots don't mean much because as we go through the size range, uh, the other variables vary. So for example, if we divide the size range in the previous data plot, this is typical to all kinds of data, into equal intervals and evaluate the means, we see that the steel ratio going through the size varies, one to 10. So in these diagrams, we don't see the size effect, it's a common effect. The same thing of shear span, compressive strength, and maximum aggregate size. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, written, and there's a standard method of economy and medicine, that you can filter out such biased data, uh, I, I mean unintentionally biased, such that computer program deletes the points at the margin of the cloud of data and creates a sub-base. And that sub-base is an essentially uniform uh, secondary parameters through the range, and then you see, without assuming any model, what is the trend. The other way, of course, is regression, the multivariate regression, but then you must come up with a model, which may be disputed. So this is independent of any model, and it should be used for all kinds of arguments, I think, not just for this. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Next presenter, Professor Benz from the University of Toronto.
Okay, thank you, DJ. Uh, welcome all. I'm going to talk today about um, our proposal for simplifying the ACI share provisions. At first glance, you say simplifying it in what sense? Two routes is pretty simple. That's true. I have here a slide, though, from 1971 that was made by my co-presenter, Michael Collins, uh, from about 40 years ago. You can tell it's an old-style uh, photograph of the whole thing. This has 12 equations that say VC equals on it. Since then, we've made progress. We got rid of the D-beam equations and the wall equations, leaving us still with eight equations for VC. And um, we can do better than that, I think, in order to make things more simplified by having a single equation for VC that covers all cases, which is what we're looking for. Now, I was walking around the end of January, actually, looking around downtown, and I saw a building that had sprouted up out of nowhere, which is shown here in the background. And if I zoom in, we see a building like this. Now, the left-hand side of that building was what was intended in 1971. Regular geometry, easy configuration. The right-hand side is what we're doing now. The architects are looking for very interesting complex shapes, and we end up with a fascinating case of a pointy slab with an angled column. Now, if we look at that, we know from our statics calculation we're going to have the compression in the column actually changing an angle, requiring, therefore, a significant tension in that main slab. So what happens? We want to see what happens to that by ACI 318.14. Well, there's enough tension in that slab by hand calculation to say that, in fact, the shear strength equals zero. But then the engineer says, no problem, we'll put lots of reinforcement inside. But that doesn't actually matter, because adding reinforcement doesn't change the gross tensile stress in the concrete, and therefore doesn't increase the shear strength. So what we do instead? Well, we'll pre-stress it. So if we pre-stress it with 1,000 PSI pre-stress, we end up with a shear strength of about 250 PSI. If you use instead the pre-stressed equations rather than axial load equations, you get a different number that's significantly higher in this case. And if you look for the most, uh, most rigorous case of pre-stressed concrete with axial tension, there actually isn't an equation. Of those eight equations we have, we don't have a pre-stress equation with that on top. So we can say, therefore, the shear strength of that red arrow is somewhere between 250 PSI and zero, and I don't know. And <laughs> that's where we're aiming to try and make things better, to have a single equation that will cover all these cases. So what do we do in a case like this? Well, we go back to first principles. So over the last 30 or 40 years at the University of Toronto, we've been involved in a research program to try to better understand how cracked reinforced concrete behaves. And that's a shell tester on the left-hand side that's with Frank Vecchio and Michael Collins developed the equations of the modified compression field theory up on top. Now, I made this small so you could not see the equations because we don't need to know the equations. <laughs> and, um, what we have seen, though, from these individual results is that what's going on in terms of shear and concrete member down below is in the web. The shear stress is resisted by the web, the compression region carries part, but the web carries the majority of the overall effect. And of those 15 equations, what we need to keep track of is aggregate interlock, is shear on the crack, yielding of stirrups, well understood, crushing of concrete, and the longitudinal strain at mid-depth, which is what ties it all together. If we have a larger longitudinal strain at mid-depth, we end up with wider cracks and lower strength. If we have a narrow or a small longitudinal strain, we end up with a stronger shear strength. And this one concept ties together all 15 of those equations into one aspect. Aggregate interlock. Aggregate interlock can be thought of, I think, most conveniently by thinking of Lego. We have Lego pieces on the left-hand side. If we take those two pieces and squeeze them together and try and slide them with respect to each other, they can't slide because, in fact, geared together, in a sense. And it doesn't depend upon cohesive stresses that are transferring across those Lego bricks. They can quite happily handle those stresses by themselves. The specimen you can see at the bottom is currently resisting 50,000 pounds of force across a crack that has no reinforcement, no dial action. It's basically just got tension reinforcement only. And it can carry those forces just fine. It's reliable and repeatable. Now that aggregate interlock is going to be related to the crack width. The wider the cracks are, the easier they are to slide. How do you calculate a crack width? Well, basically it's a crack spacing multiplied by strain perpendicular to that crack. The crack spacing relates to the member depth, and that gives us the size effect. That is, if the member depth increases, we have wider cracks, we have lower shear resistance, and we have, therefore, a weaker section. What about that strain? That strain is coming from that longitudinal strain epsilon x, and that's going to give us what we call the strain effect. The larger the longitudinal strains, the lower the strength is. Now, of course, epsilon x is longitudinal, and the crack is diagonal, so you need a set of equations to translate, and that's the modified compression field theory as one option. What are we proposing for ACI 318? Well, this is the equation we have for VC. As you can see, the proposal starts with two root FC prime. We've been using that too long. There's no need to get rid of it because for many cases it works very, very well. We have two modifying factors to it, though. We have the shear depth of D in there. The first modifying factor relates to the strain effect. Second modifying factor relates to the size effect. That term SX in the size effect equation is based upon geometry and the aggregate size. So that's member depth, basically. Something you know before you do the design. You have a good idea what the geometry is going to be. The strain effect epsilon x, we can calculate that 
based upon the applied loads in the cross section, or we can make an assumption. How can we make an assumption? Well, we know that the longitudinal strain can't be very, very high because that'll result in a flexural failure. And that's a different equation for behavior. So as a result, we can make some simple assumptions that epsilon x is about 5 6 of yield, let's say, 50 KSI steel at a shear failure. Put that in the first equation, put in uh, 12 inches in the second equation, that equation for VC turns into VC 2 root FC prime. 2 root FC prime works well. How well does it work overall? These are some experiments, we an experiment we did last year. This was a 13 foot deep cross section. You may have seen it in Concrete International over there. The blue line shows the ACI prediction for shear strength with depth. The red line shows this proposal that was made before June 2014. And the, the uh, green dot you see right there is the experiment that was done after the proposal went in. We did not need to change the proposal after we made the experiment it resulted in quite a good result. Now, unless you're worried that in fact it's not relevant how big that is, it, the specimen's too large, well, the Wilshire Grand Hotel in Los Angeles has actually got a 17-foot thick slab with no transverse steel, so therefore we need to be able to do a good job. I've got some concerns with the other presentations. Um, a number of the proposals suggest that we need to have more transverse reinforcement than we currently have. I don't believe that's true because a database comparison to the existing ACI code is fine. Some of them say 10-inch slabs are currently unsafe and need to be thicker. That's not true either based upon comparison to the existing database. The floor we have under our feet right now is just fine in terms of its overall safety. And if we do make those top two conclusions actually, that means for assessment, our existing structures across the United States are going to be not safe enough when the, most of them are just fine. Shear only into compression region, I believe that's just not true. Uh, finally, what are the strengths of this proposal? Number one, safety. Size effect is accounted for appropriately. We also have higher maximum shear limits. We're good for coupling beams. Number two, simplicity. There's one equation for VC for all cases. VCW, VCI, all the same. Number three, generality. It applies to things like internal FRP. High strength steel, it accounts for that too. Next, rationality. It's based upon a more fundamental theory rather than a curve fit. We're not doing a calibration here. We're doing a validation for each individual test. Consistency, most current designs are unchanged because most cases you have relatively thin slabs. And finally, it's proven. Similar proposals, similar equations to this have been used in Canada for the last 10 years. The building I showed at the beginning was designed with the proposal, and it works quite well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next presenter, Professor Shu from University of Houston. This presentation, one-way shear design method, Unified Theory by UH-NTU version is prepared jointly by the University of Houston, that's UH, and the National Taiwan University, that's NTU. This design method is the unification of three concepts. First, Frost compression zone concept, which states that the contribution of concrete VC is proportional to the depth of the compression zone C. Second, Shu's arch action factor concept, which states that VC is proportional to the shear span to death ratio with a power of 0.7. Third, Bazan's size effect law concept, which states that VC is proportional to the given factor, which is a function of the beam height H. This slide gives the shear equation for non-pre-stressed rectangular beams. The nominal shear strength, Vn, is the sum of the contribution of concrete, Vc, and the contribution of steel, Vs. In the Vc term, C is based on elastic analysis. The Vs term is based on the minimum shear resistance concept. This slide gives the shear equation for pre-stressed beams. In addition to the VC and VS terms, this equation includes the VP term, which is the 
vertical component of the draped pre-stress strands. In the VC term, we include a flange factor, F sub flange. F sub flange is equal to 1 for rectangular section and is equal to 1.8 for T or I sections. In the VC terms, in C is based on ultimate strand analysis. Also, the expression for VC maximum includes the flange factor. This slide shows how the arch action factor is derived. That is, how we derive the curve for the shear span to death ratio with a power of 0.7. The curve is the lower bound of the data points for large beams with height equal to or greater than half a meter. We have neglected the data points for small beams with height less than half a meter. These smaller beams are also more than six years old. I would like to point out particularly Alan Maddox's 13 beam tests with the whole range of shear span to death ratios from 1 to 4.5. Maddox's tests clearly substantiate our lower bound curve where the shear span to death ratio should have a power of 0.7. This slide gives the three references which contain the database used in the analysis. The analysis results are given in the following slides. This slide gives the contribution of concrete in reinforced concrete that's RC beams. It shows that this constant in the VC term should be 2.0. This slide gives the contribution of concrete in pre-stress concrete or PC beams with T and I beams. It shows that the constant in the VC term should be 2.0 the flange factor in the VC term should be 1.8. This slide gives the, the test to calculated ratios of shear strength for concrete compressive strength from 15 to 125 megapascal. The average test to calculated ratios of shear strand, that's AVG, is 1.25, and the coefficient of variation, that's COV, is 25%. This slide gives the test to calculated ratios of shear strand for concrete compressive strength from 20 to 75 megapascal. The average test to calculated ratios of a shear strength, AVG, is 1.37, and the coefficient of variation, COV, is 21%. This slide gives the analysis of ACI Shear Design Example 3. The cross-section of this pre-stress beam is slender and the web thickness is thin. At the distance D from the support, VC is equal to the applied shear Vn. Therefore, 
no failure will occur. In contrast, VC is much smaller than the applied shear at the quarter point. Consequently, this beam fails due to flexural shear failure at about quarter point. This slide gives the analysis of example two in the UH research report. The cross-section of this pre-stress beam is bulky and the web thickness is thick. VC is much less than the applied shear VN at the distance D from the support. Much worse than that at the quarter point. Consequently, this beam fails due to wet shear failure at the distance D from the support. Comparison of slide 12 and slide 13 shows that the proposed design method can predict the two modes of failure in pre-stress beams. That is, web shear failure at the distance D from the support and the flexural shear failure at about quarter point. Thank you for your attention.